it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, a stockbroker in New York, a Zen monk in Kyoto, a Hasid in Jerusalem. Your society is held together by boundaries and definitions. And anything which dissolves those boundaries and introduces uh, relativity into cultural modeling is felt to be threatening because we like to believe that our reality is somehow sanctioned, that this is how it should be. But in fact, you know, that's just a, a cultural judgment. All cultures think that their culture represents a sanctioned reality. It doesn't. It just represents the current download of the, their linguistic enterprise. Um, the, at the core of the Western anxiety about boundaries is something that we are very proud of, that we believe we invented. We call it the ego. Sometimes we call it the democratic individual. Uh, we say no, no Eastern society could have produced this. We took this from the Greeks. We perfected it through the Romans. We brought it up through the medieval period. John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and all those folks fixed it up for us in the 18th century. Thomas Jefferson ironed out the wrinkles. And modern America is the shining example of uh, what you can do if you empower the ego, the citizen, the individual. We want nothing of tribalism, still less of collectivism, and God forbid, nothing whatsoever to do with communism. They all set us going. Um, but in fact, the ego is appropriate only to a certain point. I mean, yes, we need egos. So that when you take someone to dinner, at a reasonable restaurant, you place food in your mouth, not their mouth. This is, this is what the ego is for. It tells you who pays. Um, but in fact, what the ego is, is the return to consciousness of this psychic structure related to the patterns of dominance. And the way I think of the ego is it's like a cyst or a calcareous growth or a tumor that gets going in the personality. And if not treated, it becomes chronic. And then there is no cure. There can only be you know, a certain amount of maintenance and uh, medication of it. But it's, it's incurable, except unless we resort to not only non-prescription drugs, but uh, drugs currently illegal. In other words, the psychedelics, through this boundary-dissolving function, dissolve that boundary as well. And so they promote a larger sense of the world than the values of uh, capitalism, competitiveness, object fetishism, property acquisition, and the bottom line, in power. So the, the issue, as was always sensed since the 60s forward, I think, is not simply a, an issue of religious freedom or an issue of an eccentric minority social practice being tolerated by uh, the majority, the way they tolerate handing out pamphlets in the airports or something like that. The, the issue is, in fact, what kind of, of people shall we be? And then what kind of society shall we put in place? And that's why my theory of evolution is not simply a dry footnote on uh, an issue that involves anthropologists, climatologists, and biologists, but it turns into a political issue because our unhappy, addicted, ego-driven condition has become not simply the source of our own unhappiness, 
that was bad enough. But now it's the source of great discomfort and dislocation for all life and human society on the planet. We, we are out of control. We are basically severely addicted to things and cannot stop ourselves. Uh, and we know, or we should know, that there is not enough petroleum, heavy metal, so forth and so on, in the planet to give all the thing addicts all the things that we know they must have in order to be happy. We have spread this intellectual virus from pole to pole, to Turkmenistan and Borneo, to the upper Amazon and to the Tajik. Everybody wants kids, you know. Everybody wants the pause that refreshes. Uh, what are we going to do about this? Well, so far, we've been treating it like an endless garden party. There's no serious plan on the table to deal with this at all. Uh, uh, I, I think that the momentum of human history is pushing us inexorably toward some kind of day of reckoning and in which we are either going to have to turn consciously toward brutality and selfishness and say, well, let India go. Let Bangladesh go, triage, cost too much, can't possibly fix the problem. In order to maintain our lost compounds and our 50 channels of television and the endless availability of arugula, we have to let uh, India go. We're going to have to turn that way. In other words, each consciously participate in a choice to brutalize uh, the human enterprise, or we're going to have to uh, seriously talk about very major restructurings of our society. And I don't really know how we do that. I was living in Northern California a couple of years ago when they wanted to close an air base near here, and the newspapers were filled with weeds for weeks with analysis of whether Western civilization could absorb this hammer blow at the very heart of its institutions, opposing one friggin' air base, for crying out loud. That's not my idea of major change, you know? We may have to give up some of our pretty things. We may have to discipline some of the irresponsible uh, social philosophies that run amok among us. And no, I don't mean the advocacy of psychedelic plants. I mean uh, the Roman Catholic Church's position on population control in the Third World. And the Germans take quite a knock for the Holocaust if the Catholic Church manages to push more people into death, disease, and degradation every year and the Holocaust managed in its entire show, and uh, it's thought rather crass to even mention the fact. It seems to me, as long as these Catholic bishops can show their face in public, that we are uh, in complicity with mass murder. It's not pleasant news, but what are you going to do about it? Uh, Islamic fundamentalism, another bunch of knotheads with an anti-human agenda. What are we going to do about this? Are we going to go gently into that good night of planetary chaos, extreme distortion of class structure, defense of what we have at any cost against those who have nothing? There doesn't seem to be any other plan on the horizon. Arthur Kessler, who probably never thought he would be quoted by Terence McKenna, a very conservative character. You'll recall he was a, a Marxist who turned on Marxism and wrote a very interesting intellectual life. He wrote a book 30 years ago called The Ghost in the Machine 
And he made a, a, a case similar to mine, but a little simpler. He observed, human beings are hardwired for homicide. This is what we do best, because this was something we had to do, apparently, at some point in our past, at least in Kessler's view. He didn't believe in a mushroom paradise. But he reached the same conclusion that I have, which is, we need a pharmacological intervention on antisocial behavior, or we are not going to get hold of our, uh, our dilemma. And uh, I, I, you know, there have been dystopias based on drug intervention on aggressive behavior. You all remember Brave New World, where every time anybody raised their voice, they were given a a gram of soma, and told a gram is better than a damn grab a thought in their head. Well, that's a terrible drug. Let's not introduce that. Uh-oh, the bad news is we've had it for decades. It's called television. You know, we have millions of people in larval, low-awareness lives in their little condominium apartments just ladling this garbage into their minds. The average American watches five and a half hours of TV a day, so imagine how much time these people watch. I mean, to, to think of that as human at all, if that were a drug, we'd be up in arms. You know, people were loaded at home with that level of mental condition day after day after day. We would, we would do something about it. So my, uh, you know, I don't, ha I can't uh, propose a grand solution, but I do think that it is uh, uh, pregnant with implication that here at the end of the 20th century, with all of these problems hammering down on us, the news comes from the rainforests and the deserts that these Aboriginal people while we made the descent into history and got the top quark and planted the flag on the moon and all that, they kept the faith. And they have a materia medica, a toolbox, that can carry us back into a connection uh, with the planet. Now, the question might be asked, why, why do, you, do you have such overwhelming faith in what is, after all, a, a substance? A drug. I mean, don't psychedelics just cause you to see pretty pictures and patterns and tally up your gains and losses and then you come down and that's it? And the answer is no. What is mysterious here, and I mentioned it in the early part of my talk, what is mysterious here is this thing we call the psychedelic experience. Those people nailed to the ground around the campfires 50,000 years ago, they didn't know what it was. And when we go in there, armed with our Heidegger and our Husserl and our Wittgenstein and our Merleau-Ponte, we don't know what it is either. There has been no progress in 60,000 years in reducing the psychedelic experience to a known quantity. It is as terrifying, as awesome, as ecstatic, as irreducible to us uh, as it was to them. Well, what is that? As secular people, uh, we rarely experience religious awe, especially of the uncontrollable sort. Uh, I believe that what makes the psychedelic experience so central is that it is uh, a connection into a larger modality of organization on the planet, which is a fancy way of saying it connects you up to the mind of nature herself. The planet is not uh, uh, just a hodgepodge of competing species. That's the old evolutionary model. That's been obsolete for decades. The new evolutionary model is that where we see species, nature sees only a gene swarm. 
genes moving at various speeds, being transferred around, a large percentage of them by sexual propagation, but a large percentage of them by asexual and vegetative propagation, and still others by more exotic uh, methods of propagation, such as go on in the fungi and the bacteria. Uh, the world is a gene swarm, and people like Lynn Margolis and uh, James Lovelock have been suggesting for years that the Earth is a kind of thermostatic self-regulator. Well, if you carry that idea far enough, thermostatic self-regulator is a way of saying a kind of computational engine, a kind of computer, a kind of mind, a kind of mind, the dying mind. The reason those mushroom-eating, orgiastically behaving people worshipped the great horned goddess, the reason they imaged the numinous other as feminine, was because they had a connection into a kind of overarching intelligence that they instinctively and intuitively felt to be feminine. And we retain this in our languages as the idea of Mother Nature and the femininity of the land and so forth and so on. But it's just become a distant metaphor to us. I think our intelligence is, is a source of toxicity to nature and discomfort to ourselves unless our values are based on planetary values are linked to the values of the rest of nature. And that means we uh, need to fit ourselves more appropriately into the scheme of things by limiting our numbers, by uh, limiting our extraction of natural resources and toxification of the environment. We need to realize that there is a hegemony of life on the planet, not necessarily a hegemony of intelligence. Intelligence is not a license to trample. It, the, the proper role of intelligence in a planetary ecology is that of gardener, caregiver, and, uh, and uh, maintainer of balance. Well, so where do we go, and how what do psychedelics have to say about that? Well, uh, I, I believe that psychedelics show us something which uh, capitalist, consumer, fetish-oriented society doesn't want us to know. What psychedelics show us is the incredible richness of our minds that that you, little you, can produce more art in a 20-minute burst of hallucinatory intoxication than the Western mind has produced in the last 500 years. Our socially created space is incredibly impoverished. You know, we have Picasso's contribution and Pollock's contribution and everybody's contribution but it all together is as nothing compared to the richness that resides in each one of us a half inch behind your eyebrows. We are told, you know, oh, well, if you want beauty, you have to own a Lexus. Or, uh, you know, if you want a sense of satisfaction, then you need a triple car garage. On and on. This, this is absolutely uh, not true. These are substitute addictions that will never satisfy for the genuine article. And the genuine article is a connection into the dying mind. Well, I don't believe or expect for a moment that ever again, naked, tattooed, and joyous, we will herd our cattle across the grasslands of Africa. I mean, there are six million of us. That chance has been blown. Uh, but but what what can we do to make to ameliorate our situation? Well, I 
have always been an optimist. I'm more optimistic right now than I have been for a long time, because sometimes when you're an optimist, you're an optimist simply on principle. You believe it's going to turn out all right, but you don't see how it possibly could. I'm beginning to see how it possibly could turn out all right. And uh, my notion is, First of all, I, I follow in my thinking about shamanism and I follow the great historian of religion, Messi Eliad, who got it almost all right, except that he never embraced psychedelics. He thought they were decadent. But that was just his French European education and he came too early. But anyway, Eliad wrote a book called Shamanism and then he subtitled it The Archaic Technique of ecstasy. Now he wrote the book in French. In French, technique has a connotation that it doesn't have in English. It means both a way to do things and it means technology. Later, the French sociologist Jacques Delors wrote a book called Propaganda. And the little banner under which his book flew, which is printed right on the front is he says, there are no political solutions, only technological ones. The rest is propaganda. And then he spends 200 pages explaining what he means by political solutions, technological solutions, and propaganda. By the rules of understanding, I agree. I think ideology is toxic. All ideology. It's not that there are good ones and bad ones. All ideology is toxic, because ideology is a kind of insult to the gift of human free thinking. I mean, if you adopt some ideology, Leninism, Mormonism, it doesn't matter, then you have all the answers. You just go and look in the catechism. Well, I don't know why they issued you a brain. They could have just given you the catechism. Uh, technology as the counterpoint to uh, ideology is a very different animal. Now, right now, we're going through a technophobic phase because people think technology means exploding nuclear power plants and, uh, you know, irradiated food and TV. But all technology really means in the McLuhan sense, is the extensions of man, the extensions of man. And so language is a technology, shamanism is a technology, psilocybin is a technology, and certainly the internet is a technology. It's slowly, I think, dawning on a number of people that if, we, if we're talking about hallucinogens as consciousness-expanding drugs, then the only difference between a drug and a computer is that one is slightly too large to swallow. <laughs> and our best people are working on that problem, even as we speak. The drugs of the future will be much more like computers. The computers of the future will be much more like drugs. And I think what we have to recognize is that we are in a very brief and low energy technical phase in technology. Basically, we're at the tail end of the, of the petrochemical steam era. And where we are headed is towards the solid state, fiber optic, global community of the Internet. And uh, I, when I was in San Francisco two weeks ago, the buzz was all about uh, VRML, the virtual language markup, the virtual reality markup language whose protocols are being set now so that we will be able to build websites on the net that you can put on your helmet and walk around in. Sun Microsystems is about to introduce something called Hot Java, which will let you build and interact with your website without going through your server. Bandwidth is broadening as we speak. Uh, the whole world is being brought 
into the domain of electricity. And you may not know it, but Marshall McLuhan thought that this was the descent of the Holy Ghost. As a convert to Christian to Catholicism, he sort of went the opposite direction. I mean, as a convert to Catholicism, he decided that the descent of the third person of the Trinity and the worldwide spread of electricity were the same event. So I think that uh, what we have to do is dematerialize culture in every way possible, and that means pharmacologize culture, computerize culture, network culture, virtualize culture, and uh, make of it thereby uh, a tool for the production of our poetic flights, a technology for the putting in place of our dreams, as exhibits that we can show each other. This is what it is. This is what technology can be in the service of boundary dissolution. In the service of boundary maintenance, you get hydrogen bombs and sarin. In the surface of boundary dissolution, you get psychoactive substances and the internet and uh, sexual experimentalism social justice, tolerance, and community. And the, the choice is to be made on an individual level by each and every one of us. I don't advocate a mass outbreak of psychedelic use. I think these things are a private matter. They are the only thing comparable to them in our human experience is our sexuality. And that's a private map, isn't it? How we express it, how we act it out, who we do it with, what we think about it, and what we choose to say in public about it. It's all uh, in our hands. I do not think that uh, the government, under the guise of some phony, alarmist, pseudoscientific rhetoric, should attempt to control the evolution of consciousness. After all, if these things truly are consciousness expanding, it doesn't take too much intelligence to realize that it is the absence of consciousness that is causing our flirtation with extinction and planetary disaster. If there is any way to raise consciousness, diet, drug, machine, sexual practice, mantra, young whatever it is, we should be furiously exploring and applying it. Because if we should fumble the ball, if we should actually, uh, where our ancestors over thousands of generations did not fail, if we are to fail, the magnitude of the tragedy will be immense. Because failure is not inevitable. It is not inevitable that we should fail. There are ideas, personalities, technologies uh, available right now which, if honestly explored and, and implemented, could rescue the human enterprise from the disgrace that hovers over us. We don't want this to end in a toxified garbage pit ruled by Nazis which is, you know, the way we may well be headed. Uh, the Gaian mind has always been there. Nature originally, through the plants and shamanism, provided the tools for us to access this incredible natural database. Through the vicissitudes of history, previous generations lost the key in Western society. Since the 1960s, the key has been refound. It's a matter of great social controversy. It's a matter of, uh, of, of great risk to those who take it, how they will be viewed by their peers. But there is no longer, uh, ignorance is no longer an excuse. Anthropology.
anthropology in the last hundred years has laid at our doorstep the tools necessary for an archaic reconstruction of uh, society and uh, human values within that society. It's inconceivable that Western industrial capitalism could run on another 500 or 1,000 years. Uh, it, it will not continue as it has. It will deteriorate under the pressure of resource scarcity. And what few democratic values we have obtained, what little space for reasoned discourse has been created, will be the first to be swept away. So it's, it's very, very important that people take back their minds and that people analyze our dilemma in the context of the entire human story, from the descent onto the grassland to our potential destiny as citizens of the galaxy and the universe, we are at a critical turning point. And as I say, the tools, the, the data that is, holds the potential for our salvation is now known. It is available. It is among us. But it is misrepresented. It is slandered. It is litigated against. And uh, it's up to each one of us to relate to this situation in a fashion that will allow us to answer the question that will surely be put to us at some point in the future, which is, what did you do to help save the world? Thank you very much for your attention. I'll try to repeat the question. The question refers to something which I didn't mention here because I figure an hour is long enough to unload one earth-shattering theory rather than two. Uh, I sort of have my foot in a whole other branch of things, which is, which let's call it physics, let's be generous. Uh, but I, I do think that that uh, history is an acceleration of organic nature and that history is going faster and faster, shortly to be replaced by something else going even faster. And that, in fact, what we're involved in here at the end of the 20th century is some kind of uh, accelerated forward escape into transformation. And I, when I lecture that subject, I more or less imply that it's inevitable. In other words, it's not that we have to do X, Y, or Z, that it's on track. I think it is on track, but I also think there's a place for the kind of politics we discussed this evening, because as the world gets crazier and crazier, a lot of people are going to get very, very anxious. This thing in Oklahoma City is an example of people getting anxious. Uh, so what needs to be done is to spread the idea that anxiety is inappropriate. It's sort of like we, we who are psychedelic have to function as sitters for society because society is going to thrash and resist and think it's dying, and be deluded, and uh, regurgitate unconscious material, and so forth and so on. And uh, the goal and the role then for psychedelic people, I think, is to try and spread calm. I'm very convinced that things are going to get a lot nuttier than they are, and they're a lot nuttier now than they have been for a while. But it, it isn't it is, doesn't mean the bad people are winning or that we're going to fumble the ball or anything. The mushroom said to me once, it said, this is what it's like when a species departs for, for the stars. It's, it's a birthing. It's complicated. Um, if you had never seen a human birth and you came around the corner of a building in your daily round and it was happening... It vibrates medical emergency. 
I mean, blood is being shed, tissues stretched, it doesn't. It, you really have to have your chops together to step back and say, how wonderful, new life coming into the world. <laughs> because uh, you know, that's not the vibe of it. And I think that's the circumstance that we're in. This is the birth canal to a new order. And at the moment, it looks like suffocation, constriction, limitation, possible death. But uh, we need to inform ourselves and get a big perspective. And there's no way to get a big perspective like education and psychedelic experiences. If we can see history for what it is, it's a, it's a 25,000 year nearly instantaneous transition from one state of being to another. And yes, there are 1,500 generations of people who live in that paper-thin transition time. But when it's over, it's over, and we will leave history behind the way you dump a used placenta, I'm sure. Yeah. Reliable information on the relationship between psychedelics and early uh, Christianity. Reliable information on psychedelic use in early Christianity. The answer is no. I mean, there there is a book by John Allegro called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. He was a very respected Dead Sea scholar till he wrote that book, uh, and that basically finished his career as a classicist, he says some incredibly provocative things in that book. To judge whether he's right or wrong, you would have to be a, an Assyrian philologist, about which I know nothing. So to the lay person, it seemed to be quite an impressive book, but apparently to his specialist colleagues, it was sloppy thinking and a travesty and a reason to deny tenure. Um, St. Augustine was uh, a Montanist before he, no, he was a Manichaean before he converted to Christianity. And uh, he mentions that Manichaeans forbade the use of mushrooms, the eating of mushrooms. It doesn't say the use of mushrooms. But the ancient Middle East, we don't know very much about uh, psychedelic sacramentalism. It may have been there. Uh, it may not have been there. Absence of reference is not proof of absence because of cult secrecy and, and other factors like that. We do know that, the, or, or we feel we're on firmer ground in saying that the Greek mystery religion emphatically probably were psychedelic, especially the, the Eleusinian mysteries, the mysteries which were practiced on the plain outside of Athens every year for over 2,000 years. And everybody who was anybody in the ancient world made the journey to Eleusis to celebrate the greater mysteries, which were celebrated in September interesting approach to psychedelics there. You could only legitimately participate in the mystery of Eleusis once in your life. So imagine if you had a single high-dose psychedelic experience under ideal conditions, in other words, in darkness, under the care of experts, and then the rest of your life you had to sort it all out based on what happened that one evening. It was extraordinarily powerful for the ancient world. Eventually it was destroyed. Alaric the Visigoth, who was a barbarian, but that didn't stop him from being a convert to Christianity. Uh, Alaric the Visigoth burned Eleusis uh, on his way to North Africa to burn other things. Yeah. I was wondering, Terrence, if you've had a chance to read The Emperor's New Mind by Roger Penrose, I think. Uh, it's an argument against the idea of uh, AI, artificial intelligence. 
And whether you were able to follow his argument, because I would think that you would probably be opposed to his argument. I haven't read the book. I like Roger Penrose's early work. He's saying artificial intelligence is impossible. Yeah, based on, and he goes through the Turing, uh, and I heard you bring it up once. The Turing test. The Turing test of artificial intelligence, and he also uh, brings in the uh, incompleteness theorem. Uh -huh. Oh, Gurdle's incommensurability thing. A little gurgle, please. <laughs> In two, four time. Well, I don't have a particularly strong opinion one way or another on AI. I certainly think computers will, can be a lot more intelligent than they are before we settle the question of whether they can pass the Turing test. You all know the Turing test is this test Alan Turing was a mathematician. He figured it out during World War II. And it's basically, if you call X on a telephone and you can't tell whether X is a person or a machine, then X passes the Turing test. And every year they have Turing tests uh, where judges converse by telephone with computers and people and try and decide which are the computers and which are the people. And it's still pretty easy uh, because the people exhibit exasperation, incorrect information, and misinterpret the question, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> there are some wild thinkers out there, far wilder than me, uh, you know, if you want to read a wild book, read the uh, uh, Hans Moravec's book, Mind Children, The Future of Human and Artificial Intelligence. There's a book. Uh, and uh, Kipler's uh, book is a, uh, uh, the end of all speculation where artificial intelligence uh, is concerned. Uh, I think machine-human interfacing is, is very important. I think that the debate about whether a computer can think like a human being is kind of not very interesting. Computers think like computers. Already, vast amounts of what we call human society are entirely run by machines, including uh, very important financial sectors, market decisions, uh, resource extraction decisions, inventory resupply decisions that feed clear back from the warehouse to the mine. In other words, machines say how much tin should be extracted and at what rate, and therefore to a certain degree say who should come to work and who shouldn't on certain days. Uh, a lot of design work of circuitry, engineers will simply tell a computer what the circuit should do and leave the actual architecture of the circuitry to machine decision. Uh, this means, you know, large, more and more parts of the human world are being over, given over to machines to design. But when you see how much of the world looks like the arrival concourse of an international airport, uh, having computers design the world might not be uh, a bad idea. Uh, definitely computers figure in our future. I mean, I wasn't joking when I said drugs and computers are migrating toward each other. I can imagine a, a world, and this is not the ultimate world by any means, a world five, six, seven years in the future where the equivalent of today's advanced Macintosh would be something you glue on your thumbnail and communicate with that way. And you know, beyond that lie, you know, enormous uh, computational and data accessing abilities that may be accessed through implants. We're going to have to decide, you know, how much of the monkey we want to take with us into the future. We don't want to take the homicidal killer. We don't want to take uh, the male dominator. It would probably be a mistake to leave the body entirely behind. 
uh, after all, the body gives us our orientation in the world and our sense of ourselves as somehow co coextensive with animal life. But how much of what we call human is really human is going to be a major topic for discussion uh, from here to the end of time.